Hi, and welcome to the Punk CX podcast. My name is Adrian Swinsko, and I'm an advisor, best-selling author, speaker, and general explorer when it comes to customer and employee experience. I'm really interested in figuring out what it takes to build organizations that produce better outcomes for both customers and employees. So with that in mind, I seek out and interview CEOs, entrepreneurs, business and tech leaders, authors and academics to uncover some clues about what it takes to build this, such an organization. Now, some of you may know the podcast as the Rare Business Podcast, but I decided to rename and rebrand the podcast recently. This is for a number of reasons. First one was to mirror the title of my book, Punk CX, which was published in June 2019. Uh, two, because I'm a fan of punk music. And three, it's just more fun, right? Anyway, if this is your first time listening to one of these interviews, then hello and welcome. And please do dive into the archives at adrianswinsko.com as I've now completed over 300 of these interviews in the last few years. If this is not your first time listening, then welcome back and thank you. Anyway, that's enough for me right now. Let's get into the interview. So welcome to the next edition of the Punk CX podcast. With me today, I have Christian Selkow Hansen, who is the founder and CEO of Formation.ai, no less, and also the founder of the Loyalty Innovators. Uh, hi, Christian. How are you doing? Very well, Adrian. How are you today? I am splendid, sir. I'm splendid. So Christian, for the benefit of our listeners and also people that read the highlights that, that accompany the podcast, can you tell us a little bit about you and a bit about the work that you do? Sure. So I uh, started Formation.ai a few years ago, really with the goal to help retailers connect with their customers uh, to build and deepen customer loyalty. Uh, So we're a a SaaS product for B2C marketers, uh, and we have the world's first uh, dynamic offer platform. Uh, And what that means is we help big, large brands connect to their customers using first-party data uh, and do it in personal ways so that you can engage a customer throughout their customer journey um, and making sure that when you do reach out to them, you have relevant communications, you have valuable communications, and ultimately your customers respond better and you know your business can flourish. Uh, and it came out of, of a lot of work that I've done in the past, you know, working in and around Silicon Valley uh, for companies like Zenga and Square uh, and others. Awesome. Now, I know that we got connected because um, at the end of every year, of the last few years, at the end of end of every year, I people keep asking me, going, "Are you going to write a prediction piece?" And I'm like, "Ah, oh, I sort of hate predictions." But they send me a whole bunch of kind of like stuff, and I I've started. I think it was about three years ago. Started sifting through and then organizing and picking out. Here's some things that I think kind of um, I think would stand out. And this year, I think I got somewhere in the region of X, in excess of like 40 or 50 different sort of like submissions from different people. I didn't go looking for them. They just arrived. And, and I was sort of sifting through them. And I included one of the predictions that you had provided around loyalty and personalization in my sort of eight customer experience related predictions for 2022 um, that I recently posted on Force. But before we get, get to that, because I want to explore what you kind of said that, but I want to start by doing a bit of a background sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. So I want to ask you about a piece that you wrote in October of last year that stated that said, research from BCG shows that redirecting 25% of mass promotion spending to personalized offers would increase return on investment by 200%. And I was a bit like, what? So here's my question based on that. It's like, so do you think... Because I'm thinking, I'm interested in this kind of loyalty and personalization sort of, it's like a Venn diagram, the overlap sort of thing. Mm-hmm. Do you think that too many loyalty efforts are still relying on mass promotion and discounts and actually would benefit from taking a more personalized approach? And also then if so, kind of how, what should brands be doing about it? I mean, because it sounds like it's just like, you're like being a bit lazy and you need to kind of like bring, drag yourself into the 21st century. Absolutely. Um... And, and I love that idea of the the overlap, the Venn diagram between loyalty and personalization, because I think it is 
more or less 100% overlap. Mm. And the reason being, you know, loyalty programs are for your established customers. Mm -hmm. They're typically opt-in, meaning the customer is expressing an interest in getting to know your brand, your, your product, your service, over not just a single transaction, but over time. Mm. Like they're expressing this intent to build a relationship. And, you know, if we think of all the relationships we have in life, they're based on mutual understanding. Mm -hmm. You begin to know whether it's a friend, uh, you know their likes, you know their dislikes, you know the kinds of things that they're passionate about, the kinds of things that they they don't really want to go do. And that knowledge helps you be a better friend. Mm -hmm. And you begin to, you know, tailor that experience. You also generally with our friends and, and other people we do tend to spend time with, we have similar interests and similar passions. And so to me, when I think of loyalty, a hundred percent of the way it needs to be is based on that notion of personal service and that notion of a personal relationship. And if we hearken even back to, you know, how commerce was a hundred years ago, where it was far more local Mm -hmm. And far more personal. Mm -hmm. You would walk into a, you know, the corner store and they would know your name. They would know what you liked. They would know that perhaps if it was apple season and you loved apples, they might say, Hey, I even put some, you know, some apples away for you. Mm -hmm. Or we have this new fruit or we have this new thing that's in season. And that built that relationship. It was based on service. And as we've moved, you know, further into the 20th century and the 21st century, commerce became far less personal. Mm -hmm. It became effectively anonymous. And I think there's a incredible opportunity now. And I think a, a number of brands have really uh, looked at how can we make the customer experience better? And they start with, well, loyalty programs often mean that the customer is willing to share data. If we understand and can leverage that data to build a better understanding of that customer's wants and their needs, then we can service them better. And now what you need, you know, particularly in the age of, of AI and machine learning is you need tools that can start to enable you to create personal experiences, but do it at enterprise scale. And yeah. That's that's where I think there's an incredible opportunity and far too many brands are still stuck in the place where, you know, a loyalty program is effectively an earn and burn. It's you get a certain, you know, percent of your of your spend back as points or maybe as a discount, but it's the same. It, it's the absolute same for everybody. And it's a giant missed opportunity. It's almost the same tactics, but in a walled garden. Exactly. Um, because it makes me also think you could talk about this idea about it's about relationships. We talk about human relationships, you talk about commerce, kind of say a hundred years ago, and it's much more personal. And it's built on that kind of relationship and that idea. It's something I kind of wrote about kind of oh, years ago. And it felt to me that there's this dynamic, this interesting play on words, is that there's it's, it seems to me that all good relationships have these two dynamics to them, you know, over and above you like and respect that person that you have something in common, right? Mm -hmm. So taking that for granted, then these other two things define what um, a, a kind of healthiness of a relationship. And that is this, this these two things was one is interesting and one is interested. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it, and the way I explain it is that you can think about that in a, in a social context and you go, imagine you go to a party and you can you you go and you meet somebody, and they're always talking about themselves. It's like, hey, look at me! Da, da, da. On another story, and another thing, and another thing, and it's like going. They're I've all, met a few all the, people like that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And some some people even kind of like admit to being that person from time to time. And sometimes it's okay if you're super excited about because something that's mm -hmm. big that's happened that's all fine. But beyond a certain point, it gets a bit boring. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so you're on that sort of like scale, you, could, you know, that scale where almost like at an extreme level, it becomes a bit self-indulgent and slightly narcissistic and, and so on and so forth. And then on the flip side, then there's other um, side of things where somebody is, they're not necessarily talking about themselves, but they're all kind of, all they're doing is they're being really 
interested in you and they're always asking kind of questions. Now, there's two ways that this can go, depending on kind of how where you are at. Now, if you're feeling a little bit needy and vulnerable and kind of that you need in, in need of a good ear sort of thing, then that might you might be appropriate at that sort of time. But in normal times, that might just feel a bit creepy and mm-hmm. slightly intrusive. Mm-hmm. Because you're not getting anything from them. It's all about digging yeah. and digging and digging in. Yeah. yeah. It'd be a bit, wow, that's a bit crazy. So actually trying to get that sort of happy kind of medium where you have the balance of interesting and interested and actually understanding that that will change over time depending on the context and the, you know, the requirement yeah. of the situation. I think those are, those are, um, it's an interesting way to look at it to understand where the balance of the the relationship is at and the strength of the relationship. Um, and I think if you did a, if we did an audit of our activities based around those sort of different kind of dynamics and in a really honest audit, I think we might be quite surprised that we spend too much time trying to be interesting. Oh, look at us. Look over here. Here's another price discount. No, no, check it out. It's all about us. Kind of mm-hmm. like, and they people fool themselves and go like, oh, look at what people are getting. But actually, all you're trying to do is you're just trying to kind of capture their interest. Yeah. And the interested bit is kind of like, is the real challenge. Yeah, I love that uh, that framework because I think you're absolutely right. And, and I would even maybe add to it that I think many companies actually establish or are on both of the extremes. Mm. Because on one hand, they're using, for example, mass communications or mass promotions or mass offers, which only are going to be relevant for a small fraction of people. Everyone else is going to look at it and say, wait, you don't know anything about me. You don't know anything about my interests. It's completely irrelevant. And our inboxes are completely full of messages like that. Mm-hmm. Um, and on the other side, they're often hoovering up information. You know, they're asking for permission about, yeah, I'd like to understand what you're doing on the website, or I'd like to understand your preferences, or I'd like to understand, you know, please put in your birthday and please put in all these other things. And the disconnect between the two, I think, is where consumers are getting far more sophisticated mm-hmm. that we all understand there's an incredible amount of value in the data that we're sharing. Mm-hmm. And at the same time, we're not seeing the relevance or the value coming back. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I think one, one of the things that we've definitely seen in research that we've been doing is when that imbalance exists, customers stop. They reject essentially this contract they feel they've entered into, which is if I'm going to share data with you, I expect something in return. And when there's nothing in return, they say, okay, you're cut off. And, and often, you know, that is a, I, I, you know, I would say in today's world, that is a failure of, of really establishing that relationship in a, in a two-way, like it, a relationship needs to be two-way and it's, it's a failure to really yeah. establish it. And I, I don't think it necessarily, when you talk about some, what somebody kind of gets, it doesn't need to be sort of have an economic cost to it or price to it. Absolutely. It could be a something else that's of value to that 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 other party in that in that moment in time. I mean you talk about kind of building on that, you talked about research and things. I know that you you do research, you release research, you release a, a piece of research in the quarter of last in the last quarter of last year that said that uh, there's a quote in it that says that shoppers clearly value discounts, but brand loyalty hinges on more relevant and meaningful relationships with brands. And I guess that mm-hmm. speaks to that sort of thing. I mean, but if you remember that sort of that 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 research, I mean, it'd be useful to give us, I guess, the kind of what's the up to date headlines and findings and what they kind of what they mean. Because again, that's kind of like I guess frames kind of what we're where yeah. people are at. Very much so. Probably not not a tremendous surprise to to most of the folks who are listening to the show, but. You know, consumers and and particularly in the time of of COVID, consumer expectations have permanently changed. COVID, mm-hmm. in a very very rapid fashion, dramatically changed how we purchase, how we browse, how we engage with commerce broadly, and with the brands and products and services that you know that we that we you know 
all, all used kind of in our daily lives and made it far more digital. And at the same time, what it also did was change, for example, and, and reinforce even more around, let's say, media consumption. You know, we've all seen, you know, the, the subscriber upticks, for example, in Netflix that happened very early in the pandemic. And if you think about, you know, your Netflix home screen versus mine, they are completely different. They're tailored to the kinds of shows that we each enjoy. And while there definitely may be overlap, they're also personal. Mm -hmm. And so this expectation of personal has dramatically increased. Mm -hmm. And it's becoming even more stark when faced with brands who are not making the necessary changes, the necessary investments to change the experiences, to make them more relevant, to make them more personal. It's becoming much more clear to consumers of that wide chasm, mm. you know, where you have the Netflixes of the world who that is the core of their service in many ways is making it relevant. And, and you're exactly right, you know, Adrian, that it doesn't all need to be monetary. You know, one of the key things that, you know, Netflix essentially gives you is a lack of friction. Mm. You, you don't need to search through their catalog of thousands and thousands and thousands of, of pieces of content to find something you like. They're trying to make that easier for you. Mm -hmm. And they're trying to surface things that maybe you wouldn't have discovered before. And I think the same thing, you know, again, holds true for, you know, the other brands and again, products and services that you might enjoy. Consumers expectation now is, well, how are you going to help me? How are you going to make it more frictionless? How are you going to provide more value? And what we also see is that, you know, when consumers don't see that relevance and that desire or that, that manifestation of personal value, uh, they leave, you know, they, they quit. Yeah. Um, you know, there are real I'll consequences. Tell you one thing about the, the next, the flex kind of one thing, which, um, has been a bit of a bugbear of mine for a wee while. Cause I've been a Netflix subscriber for a while is they did a rating system initially that was linked to the IMDB sort of stuff, which Amazon prime has still got. And, but now they changed it because I think people were driven by the IMDb rating and kind of like, and then now you've got this 90, well, percentage match, which means that it does match you with complete dross sometimes. Um, and I sometimes kind of wonder as well that because it's personalized, I saw that there's this on the, the initial start page where you pick before you pick the profile where you can go mm -hmm. you click the button, which just goes, that show me anything type thing. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if that's, that this is it's like a random number generator where you, and is it based on your, the personal personalized pool or is it the whole catalog or whatever? Yeah, I'd like it to be, I've never, I know maybe I should go and do it later. Kind of like click on the button. And I'd like it to be random for the whole pool mm -hmm. as it were, because I think there's a value in sort of that serendipity, serendipity mm -hmm. as it were, and just kind of wandering about and finding something in a happenstance um, yeah. because but then I kind of think that this is the thing we kind of get to when we come back to if I circle back to the kind of prediction that you talked about in the Forbes piece where you kind of said 2022 is the year that brands must leverage their investments in first party data and present truly personalized offers to their loyal customers at scale you go on yeah. to say those that transition to personalized offers and experiences will have a stronger competitive advantage and drive deeper value with their loyal customer base, while those that don't make the transition will begin losing share. Brilliant. I mean, before we go into the the, 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 the Netflix sort of, kind of rabbit hole, as it were, first of all, I wanted kind of to ask about the, the whole first party data sort of thing. What do you mean by that? Because there's with Apple's changes to privacy and Google's changes to the, the third-party cookies, although they're experiment with all sorts of other things like flocks and I don't know seagulls and all sorts of other kind of like kind of things, different names for different stuff. What do we mean by when we when when we when we talk about kind of first-party data? Because just to clarify that, because that's because then we can move on from that. Because that seems to be the on the vanguard of the challenge is like harnessing that and then acting on that. Yeah. So first party data, um, and, and generally I think the terms that most people probably are, are used to hearing, but that might be helpful to just, you know, define first party data and third party data, and then perhaps zero party data, because right. that 
is starting to enter the parlance to some extent. Mm -hmm. um, so first party data is data that you're directly collecting from your customer. So whether they're uh, clicking on your website, whether they're making a purchase directly with you in store, if they give you or share their, let's say, email information for marketing purposes, all of those pieces of data would be first party. It's right. the direct relationship between a brand and, and their customer. Third party data, and this is where I think marketers for a long time now, particularly on digital channels, have been relying on third party data to do more targeting and to do things like, and that's where cookies come into play. It's where IDFA, which was the Apple device ID, came into play. Mm -hmm. That was collected essentially from a third party. And that third party probably wouldn't share the direct data with you, but would give you some access to aspects of it. So you could do, for example, targeting across their websites uh, or targeting for to maybe find new customers. And that's where I would say consumers, I think rightfully so, have concerns about how third-party data is being collected mm -hmm. and how it's being used. Mm -hmm. And so I think we're seeing in, in very much a positive way, the industry um, and you know regulation come into practice about how third-party data should be managed um, and what protections should be in place. Mm -hmm. Now, zero-party data is first is, is recognizing the relationship that for first party data, consumers, and we talked about it you know, a few minutes ago, that they realize their data has value. Mm -hmm. And in order to essentially them, for consumers to feel comfortable and for them to continue sharing for first party data, they wanna receive something in return. Mm -hmm. and, and it can be experiential, it can be a better, you know, frictionless experience. It can be, or have some, you know, kind of monetary or commerce association or value. Uh, but it needs to be a value exchange. Uh, and so, all the brands, and you know, I talk with CMOs and CDOs of, of some of the biggest brands in the world, and we're lucky enough to have, you know, a number of them as as customers. Um, they're all making investments in first party data. They recognize that for their business, you know, customer list has always been, uh, you know, if even you go back into IP, uh, has always been a protected class of IP. They, the businesses have always recognized, hey, my customer list, that's incredibly valued, valuable to me. First party data is effectively that customer list expanded. You know, it's expanded into, well, what is the person most interested in and what are how can I serve them better? And do they typically maybe buy on mobile or buy on the web or buy in store? Or is it a combination of all three? And again, if you're collecting that data and you're using it with the intent of making the service better, now you need to do that. Consumer, and again, all of our research indicates and, and other research indicates, consumers want and need to see value if they're sharing data with you. And I think this year, Again, leading brands who have already started making not just the investments in first party data, but in experiences mm -hmm. that leverage that data to make them more personal. That's where I think a few brands have really understood it's not just kind of necessary, it's a competitive advantage. It's going to give them a gigantic boost over their competitors. And, you know, the BCG research you know, indicated for retailers, it's a $70 billion opportunity. And that's, should be motivating for anyone. Well, exactly. Uh, so, so there's first party data. Yeah. But then there's the zero party data, which is sort of like the new, new thing. Yeah. Um, so what, well, I have an idea that I understand what it means, but kind of for the listeners, can you tell me yeah. kind of what, kind of what, to zero party data means to you and how it fits into all of this. Yeah. So when, for example, let's say I sign up to a loyalty program mm -hmm. and they're asking me, let's say about my preferences. So it could be, I'm, I'm signing up for a loyalty program for sporting goods. And they mm -hmm. ask, well, what sports do you play? You know, do you mm -hmm. play tennis? Do you play golf? Do you run? Do you swim? Do you hike? And 
I start checking the various sports and activities that I enjoy. Yeah. I love going for a hike. I love going camping, you know, with my family and my kids. Mm -hmm. Uh, I also, you know, I I really like uh, climbing. Mm -hmm. And so what my expectation with zero party data is that by sharing that information, I'm now going to have a tailored experience. Right. And that's not that contract in many ways is not as expressed in first party data. It still feels kind of one way Mm -hmm. and zero party data. You know, I think Forrester research is, you know, they've coined the term, but it's to express that it is a two way value exchange. Mm -hmm. We, We need consumers need to see value. They need to see relevance for sharing their data. And so it's a bit, it feels to be a bit like, so the first party data is almost like stuff that gets given or is provided almost like passively. It's through yeah. actions that can happen. So it's maybe how you browse, how you use, how you pay, all of these different sort of like things, where you live, how long you've been a customer, what type of customer, all that type of stuff. So that's almost like it just, it's stuff that's parsed out of just you interacting with the, um, on the, with the, 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 the business and a, in, in a normal occurrence and then there's kind of what you can do from that but then the kind of the first party data is almost like the step beyond that where you actually almost are, you're actively contracting with the customer to say we'd like to do better we'd like to give you kind of more can you tell us a little bit more about yourself whether it's to do with your preferences or the why behind the buy and all that type of stuff which allows you to get that sort of like that nuanced and detailed kind of picture which allows you to, I guess, to kind of be able to deliver kind of more and better to the kind of, to the customers. But I guess the the risk with all of that as well is, and this is kind of the makes it real for brands, is that if you go and I gather that that uh, that that information and you tell you more, then the stakes are higher. Yes, absolutely. No, because I was thinking, and it seems to me because I would been thinking a lot about the whole idea about about personalization and how. It's been around for some time, and you know, there's all there's all this kind of thing. I think I think Forrester a number of years ago or a few years ago kind of talked about this personalization paradox, where they said that three quarters of all customers say that they want it, but about the same number can like say that they have concerns about data and privacy and how the kind of how the data is being used. Um, but then more recent research has said that yeah, it's still established that it's important. So customers want to, brands want to deliver it. But what they also kind of find out is like there's this whack, they're missing the target because there's not a yes. shared understanding about what personalization means. And I think by going to first party data and then on to zero party data, you can actually really establish that shared understanding if you like define that contract and then you know what you're delivering to rather than just going to like more offers a la sort of, yeah. you know, this kind of math, this kind of what people are talking about, kind of like mass promotion sort of thing. And it's like a fire and, you know, and hope as it were, it hits the target. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I think the, the, and you know, you reiterated it well with zero party data, you know, customers are intentionally sharing about themselves. And with an intention, they have the expectation of value. Mm -hmm. And you, as you said, you you better deliver against it. And I think that that expectation is moving further and further into first party data as well, where sharing any data means, again, where consumers and, and customers are becoming more sophisticated. They recognize that, you know, if you, uh, if you understand the kinds of things and interested in a passive way that I'm doing, you know, that I'm interested in, if I'm browsing, camping and climbing and, and hiking types of stuff, I probably have an interest in it. And you can help me by making those kinds of things more present. Mm -hmm. Uh, For example, you know, don't give me an offer for, you know, running if I've never expressed an interest in running. Um, it's exactly. probably not going to be as relevant for me. Well, exactly. And I think you can go to the, probably a level of sophistication. You talk about being hiking and, and all those, um, and like being interested in the outdoors, but because you've been given up the kind of the location kind of like data and, and all of that sort of like stuff and you expect preferences, then you can get really sophisticated when going like, oh, the weather's changing. Therefore, you talk about the dynamic offers. You're like, weather's changing. Oh, maybe we should send Christian a uh, something like going, 
have you got enough wet weather gear because the, right. the weather's going to change? Yep. Yeah, no, it, absolutely. I mean, context, like you said, is critical. You know, at, at the end of the day, a lot of our decisions are driven by context. If mm. it is winter time, you know, you may or may not be interested in summer wear. Mm-hmm. Now, perhaps you're going from, you know, the UK to, you know, Southern Spain for, you know, a winter holiday. And absolutely, you would be interested in summer. Mm-hmm. And that's where, again, both the expression of intent and perhaps the expression of preference with zero party data can actually help a brand kind of cross that gap effectively. You know, uh, for example, at Zenga, uh, you know, and working in gaming, we spent an incredible amount of time, you know, and we were really doing amazing things with data across the entire customer experience. Uh, You know, this is now more than a decade ago, we'd invested significantly in data infrastructure and in analytics and being able to understand what players were doing in order to make the experience far better um, and more personal. And one of the interesting things was, you know, there's oftentimes when you're just looking at essentially passively collected data, you, you don't know the why. You don't understand, well, why is the person trying to do this particular thing? Mm-hmm. And that's where, again, the notion of combining first-party data and zero-party data can be unbelievably effective because sure. you can ask them. Shocker. And, and, and No, well, indeed, it's like, going, why don't you go and ask them? I mean, but then again, maybe this is the thing as well. It's like, it's not a static ask either. It should Correct. be a dynamic ask Correct. because context is always going to be changing. So it might be a case of if you arrive, it's like going, maybe you can you turn around and go like, if you've got time, 30 seconds, if you tell us a bit more about kind of what you kind of, you, you, why you're here today and what you're looking for, maybe we can help you. And then be, that becomes a contextual data gatherer. Then you could, <laughs> you end up getting into this, like an old school kind of like, um, well, it's a bit old school right now. You almost get into liquid design in terms yeah. of, what what the digital experience could be like because you're in that sort of dynamic context gather, context yeah. gathering, and, um, and and you know I think this is interestingly this this makes me think of of one of the biggest I think um, misunderstandings in a lot of way around personalization because often you know again when I talk with CMOS and I say you know what do you do personalization today they say absolutely and I say well you know tell me more. And they say, well, everyone's in a segment. So they get something that is not like everybody else. I said, you know what, that's, that's a great start. It is. Segmentation is, is, an, you know, is a good step moving from mass to a next level of, of sophistication. But I wouldn't call it personalization. Now, that's you know, maybe my definition. And in the industry, I think a lot of people you know, tend to do that. So one of the things that we've done is we've created this notion of stages of personalization where, you know, stage one, you think of as kind of macro segmentation, mm-hmm. often it's classic demographics and mm-hmm. maybe, uh, you know, you're, you're breaking your group into, or your customers into a few different major clusters. Mm-hmm. And then often we see companies move to more micro segmentation. They start to get maybe a bit more sophisticated around, for example, context, or or they try to incorporate more around preferences. The challenge with going from segmentation, even from mass to segmentation, is you are linearly increasing the amount of work. Mm -hmm. So if you have one message and now you're doing five, the way people do it is they just get five times as much work. Mm-hmm. You're creating five campaigns. You're doing five different sets of experiments. You're doing mm-hmm. five different sets of analyses. And when you go to, let's say, 50 segments, 10x again. Mm-hmm. And the challenge of segmentation is it does not scale. Mm-hmm. And even more to the point, it doesn't easily take changes in context well. Mm-hmm. Segments become static mm-hmm. and they don't. They're not dynamic. And, and again, this is when we, you know, when we've developed kind of our software and we say dynamic offers, recognizing that you need to be able to react and predict what your customers want mm-hmm. and be able to leverage all of the signals very close up to the time where you're trying to communicate or you are communicating with them. You need things to be dynamic. 
Mm-hmm. You, you need them to be able to incorporate not only context, not only preferences, but then also make predictions about what will be relevant, what will be helpful, what will be valuable, and then optimize it after the fact mm-hmm. so that you're taking in those signals and then you're being able, you're able at scale to do analysis or to optimize and say, you know what, these, let's say, you know, and, and maybe I'll give a quick example. So over the course of, of Formation's history, we've created 10, over 10 billion unique offers. Um, and often, you know, again, in our software, one of the, one of the things that it enables marketers to do is instead of creating, let's say that five or even the 50 segments, we can create a million unique offers in minutes Mm -hmm. based on a marketer defining kind of an envelope of where they're trying to, uh, or where they're comfortable kind of within the ranges of an offer. And when we say, you know, kind of an offer, it means like, we're going to ask a customer to do, let's say, one action or multiple actions. And then for that, they're going to receive something. Um, and so we change the actions. We change the specific parameters around the actions and the parameters around, you know, let's say if there is a monetary reward, how many points, and we vary and make it all of it dynamic. And so that creates billions of permutations and millions of variations that are then put into market. And again, it's done in minutes. But then it's also optimized after the fact so that you're doing a series of experiments without having to have an analytics group that is, you know, developing each one by hand. And, and that's where the future is headed. Uh, you know, it's the ability to leverage data at scale. And, you know, I find it very exciting. We, we know it works, um, but it's, it's very much in the beginning. It's very much kind of, I would say, the, the early adopters who are realizing that it's a, a giant opportunity for their brands and for their customers. I mean, so Christian, um, maybe to bring this to life and, and to kind of talk about maybe some of those early adopters um, and about the kind of like, you know, to illustrate the sort of the art of the possible, as it were, and hopefully to whet some people's appetites about kind of like taking a slightly different approach. I mean, do you have any examples of brands that are using, say, your tech or le- leading with this sort of approach, you know, the first party data, then moving on to the zero party data and what they've done and how it's benefited kind of them just to sort of, you know, just bring it all to life. Yeah. Yeah. So our, you know, our first customer uh, was Starbucks. Uh, and so, you know, the, the um, within particularly kind of North America for people who are in the loyalty program, the kinds of offers that were in the app, you know, we, we powered those um, for United Airlines. Similarly, uh, we power personal offers uh, and that en- enables United to connect with consumers at various stages of, let's say, travel readiness. You know, right. we know that particularly during the pandemic, and this is one of the, I think, more powerful ways to be, uh, to recognize context mm-hmm. was particularly, you know, it's, and it's a, it's a moving target, <laughs> very much so, mm-hmm. and, and even more complicated because of, you know, various, uh, you know, whether it's Omicron or Delta before that, you know, it was very much almost like a very dynamically moving target around readiness uh, and being able to take in and leverage a signal like that to decide, you know, one, am I going to market to a particular customer and how am I going to market to them and where is their kind of baseline pattern today? Um, you know, there were broad, broad differences between first responders who were traveling often um, to people who perhaps because of let's say family and their particular situation really had to be very careful and were not ready to travel for quite a long while mm-hmm. uh, and everyone in between. Mm-hmm. And again, the, the power of creating context and understanding it and being able to act ha- has, I think really been a, a substantial difference. Mm-hmm. Um, and then of course, across, you know, the retail landscape, you know, we work with a couple of very large grocers in the United States. Um, and similarly, being able to tailor offers both kind of, you know, again, through the pandemic, uh, as well as, you know, recognizing seasonality, uh, mm-hmm. recognizing, for example, when there's, you know, um, you know, a change in the weather, uh, as, as well as a change in preferences. 
you know, food and what you purchase is not always static. You know, you definitely have, as we all do, you know, some changes in taste, some changes in preferences, uh, sometimes driven by season, sometimes driven by diet, sometimes driven by, for example, maybe it's a medical or a family need. Yeah. And being able to leverage and see that change and be able to do that at scale so that you're not having to, again, think of this static segmented type of approach, but instead a fully dynamic and personal. And that's where we've seen, again, the, you see dramatic increases in engagement. You know, generally we see two to three X in terms of the people who are engaging with offers. And then you also see a a far, far improved kind of ROI. Um, I think there's also another thing because I know that one of your, I think members of the loyalty innovators, which I think is a community of of your customers yeah. that are leading uh, on that kind of like one of your colleagues from there who runs a, I think it's a Mexican, it's part of a Mexican resto chain. I think it's like, it's like, El, uh, it's like Taco Bell or something like that. I can't yeah. exactly remember who it, it was. El Pollo Loco. El Pollo Loco, I think it might be. Anyway, um, restaurant chain, casual restaurant chain. And I think mm-hmm. they said a really interesting thing about this whole sort of thing about sort of first party data is they, they paid attention to, and this is, I just want to make this point. I think it's an important one because I thought it was really well expressed is that they said, we paid attention to what customers tell us uh, by what they did, but also what they told us by what they didn't do. Mm-hmm. So it's almost a bit like you understand the spaces. So there's the the actual data that they give you, and then there's there's also kind of data in the spaces by kind of what they didn't do. Yeah, and I think that's a kind of. A, and I was thinking about that, going, oh, that's like that's a whole different dimension kind of there. It's like kind of like because you can compare patterns of behavior and about kind of are they missing it? Are they missing it? Why? And all these different sort of things, or is there something else going on? And I think there's a dimension to that sort of understanding and thinking about kind of um it's almost like the ones and the zeros it's like a binary sort of thing so understanding kind of what the patterns are and why those patterns sort of you know exist so i think it's it was just an i thought i'd highlight that because i thought it said it was a um it was a really interesting point that they made yeah yeah lack of engagement can be a strong signal hmm. it tells you kind of a lot if somebody doesn't do something then it tells you a lot about possibly a lot about them yeah so Christian, I mean, that's fascinating because it, it sort of lays out kind of like some of the, I think there's, there's a big challenge for many brands that want to lead and what the challenge is around sort of personalization and how it's just basically kind of the expectation, well, the opportunities just kind of shifted up and, you know, the, but the uh, the um, the expectations are, are, are still there and customers are waiting for uh, brands to fill that gap, as it were, because many of them are, have not been filling the gap. Um, so the kind of, I guess the imperative and the challenge is is there, but and I know that you're they're trying to they're trying to help. But wanted to ask you before I ask you kind of a couple more sort of general kind of questions. Is there anything else that you that you'd like to add or highlight that we've kind of like missed out about formation AI and this whole sort of personalization sort of like space? Yeah, the one thing that you know, and the question I would say I get fairly often is, yeah, how do I get started? Right, and you know, interestingly, we we actually we just put a guide out. Uh, it's available on our website. We we published last week, uh, and it encompasses kind of a, a lot of our learnings of working with some of the again the largest brands about different steps and things, uh, methods that they have used to to begin the journey and really right. to take big steps forward. And, a lot of it really boils down to um, start with one part of the customer experience and begin experimenting, right. start testing and learning. Uh, you know, I think a lot of people, they have a sense of, I need to do a massive project. I need to have multiple years. It's going to cost me an incredible amount of money. And what we've seen is often that just leads to, honestly, you know, disappointment because not only are you late, but you're generally in market with something that then feels dated. Mm -hmm. You've spent an incredible amount of money. And so you also have, 
you know, all the, the psychological challenges of, of, uh, you know, having made that big investment and feeling like you need to then, you know, continue with it and stops you from being agile. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, the, the number one thing generally is be specific, take a part of your customer journey, create some hypotheses and some experiments around it and get going. Uh, I think that's, and if I think about that from a perspective of a, of a relationship, it's a bit like, um, you can see something that you like and you want to talk to, and you can spend a lot of time thinking about kind of everything that you want to say and how it's all going to go and everything. And then they've left with somebody else. Exactly right. And you're like going, why don't you just go up and start with hello? Right. (laughs) Hi, how are you? How's it going? and you let the data in some ways you you let the conversation begin to tell you is it a fit what parts of it are a fit like what are the areas we have in common and what are the areas we don't mm-hmm. um, and that's you know it's tried and true and i think unfortunately i think too many people and again this is where i have a you know i think very strong affinity for the, i think the central tenant of punk cx which which i kind of internalize is like you know, keep it simple. <laughs> yeah. Don't yeah. overcomplicate it. Uh, it's like, don't, don't think, don't overthink, don't about overthink it. Like, it. Form a band, write some songs, organize a show. Yeah. And, and if it works, it works. If it, it keep going, if it doesn't, eh, at least you had yeah. to go. Right. And make some changes, you know, yeah. try something different, but <laughs> don't, don't spend, you know, five years creating the masterpieces that you don't know if there's a, an audience. Exactly. Um, exactly. Yeah. Brilliant. So, um, so I know you're working with some of these, big, you know, these big brands, and so they're they're at that sort of the they feel like the the vanguard. They're trying to lead the way, as it were. So, given all that, I know that you're sort of kind of in the weeds with some of these brands, trying to figure out kind of how to help them kind of deliver that sort of like that market leading experience. So, I wanted to gauge or get your perspective on what you sort of see from there about what do you think the future of service and experience kind of looks like? And what are some of the big challenges that we're going to need to be aware of and need to be ready to navigate if we're, if we're going to be successful to in delivering those better outcomes as it were? Yeah. So I think, you know, I think it starts with building that better understanding of your customer, you mm-hmm. know, building a, a more holistic picture. And that really does come down to also, building trust. So if you're going to, you know, request that data and request that, you know, first party and zero party data, it it has to be based in a, in a relationship built on trust. And then, you know, I think it's really important for brands to think about, uh, you know, the kind of the concept of a loyalty ladder, like how am I going to change and evolve and improve the experience for customers that, express an interest and engage in kind of that deeper and deeper relationship and to actually be very thoughtful about the that relationship building uh, and then really again create experiences and micro journeys that help people move further into the loyalty ladder so that it's not blind discovery it's curated um, and easy uh, and then I think when brands are able to do kind of all three of those things, it really changes the whole nature of how you think about loyalty. Um, you know, I think for a long time, brands have, and, and marketing departments have focused an incredible amount of their resources on customer acquisition, but 80% of your profits are going to come from your existing customers. Your existing customers are far more likely to buy from you again than a new one. And I think we're going to see a pretty dramatic shift with privacy and with a third-party cookie deprecation. Acquisition costs are are really skyrocketing. And what that means is you need to invest in creating lifetime value. You need to invest in the existing customers and in those relationships. And I think that that will change everything. Awesome. So if if I was to kind of go, and we talked about lots of different things, Christian, and if I was to actually to, you know, to boil it down to a piece of like best advice, as it were, to say that somebody's listening to this and they're like going, blimey, that's a big, that's a big thing. I don't know where to start. So we'll obviously link up to the the guide that you've just published, and that's kind of great. We'll point them in that direction. 
But if I was to say to you, somebody's listening to this, wants to drive increased loyalty and retention in their kind of the business, your best advice, kind of like if you were to shout down the phone to somebody go like, do this, kind of what would it be? Create a test and learn culture. Right. And, and focus on experimenting and learning about what works. And awesome. most importantly, failure has to be a part of that equation. Mm -hmm. You know, if you are not failing in some of your experiments, uh, and you know, when I say failing, you you try something, people don't engage, uh, it doesn't work the way that you know your hypothesis kind of set out. Uh, you're not trying hard enough. Yeah, the um, I kind of like I'm trying to find it, it here in the book, and this is this is me describing something that I'm. So I'm speaking to Christian on on video, but this is only going to be an audio recording. So I'm I'm describing what I, I'm flicking through this book because I wanted to show Christian a picture which I will try and find very quickly. So this doesn't turn out to be really boring very quickly. Anyway, I can't find it, but it's in the Punk Sex book. But there's a piece of graffiti in the book which was on a telephone exchange cabinet in the center of the town, that, the city that I live in. And it says that it's one of my favorite pieces of graffiti I've ever seen, which says, dude, uh, sucking at something is kind of the first step towards getting good at something. And I was a bit like... Yeah. I love that. I Brilliant. love that quote. And, and um, it, it's just the, it's that sort of thing. It's like going, you've got to get used to, you know, maybe ask yourself the question is, well, when was the last time you sucked at something? Yeah. I think too many organizations are, are stuck in an incremental improvement game where you only do essentially safe experiments. Mm -hmm. And that's not enough. Yeah. Um, the best organizations are not afraid to fail. Mm -hmm. And are not afraid, more importantly, to try and to then say, you know what? Yeah, it didn't work out. <laughs> we we got to try again. Wow. And exactly. that's where you learn. Like, you know, it's, it's amazing. You, you, you learn so much more from things that you thought would work and didn't than you do from just the, again, the minor successes. Yeah. I mean, sometimes it's easier to say, but harder to do in practice because you have to get beyond kind of egos and attitudes and culture and all that sort of, like, you know, all, all that type of stuff, but it's Absolutely. The, the, the value is definitely there. So, but before we go, Christian, I wanted to ask you a couple of um, final questions and uh, just to get your take on the whole punk thing. Cause I've been doing this I, at the end of every kind of podcast I've, I've been doing since I published punk CX. And I want to ask you two questions. One is about punk CX and one is about the new book kind of punk XL. And the first question I wanted to ask you was what one or so two words would you use to describe a more punk approach to customer experience? Simplify. Awesome. I think that's kind of been, that's definitely on the list or kind of simplification or simplify or simple is definitely kind of there. So, yeah, but absolutely right. Spot on. Um, and the second question is what company or brand do you, would you describe as being this sort of experience leader? Um, I, they're sort of, they're leading the way in all these different dimensions as the experience becomes a multidimensional thing where it's customer, employee, stakeholder, and so on and so forth. So what company brand do you think epitomizes that experience leadership sort of characteristics, behavior, sort of performance, and why? Uh, one of my favorite uh, examples is Patagonia. Yeah. Uh, so the outdoor you know, kind of equipment and clothing manufacturer uh, and very much a holistic approach. Mm -hmm. you know, I think it even starts with, you know, and, and I'm, I'm fairly confident they're a B Corp. Yeah, uh, they are. Which, they are. Which, you know, it's a, a benefit corporation, uh, which, which means that, you know, profit isn't the only single kind of metric of success mm -hmm. that their board can consider when, when thinking about the success of the company overall. Uh, and I think, for you know many people who enjoy the outdoors what that also enables patagonia to do is take a um a very kind of balanced and long-term approach to both building the customer relationships which comes like from everything from you know they will buy back kind of used gear and recycle it um or try to resell it because they realize that 
particularly with, you know, kids, they outgrow things well before when something is well-made, well before the useful life is, is, um, you know, through, uh, you know, even, you know, and I have, I have two kids, a girl and a boy, and, you know, we've, we've long bought Patagonia, um, you know, even like the name tag internally has multiple lines, you know, expecting that, you know, it's not just going to be owned by, you know, one child, but by a number. Oh, so you've got number number of lines so you can write somebody's yeah. name in it and then could put Absolutely. a name in it, cross it out, and then exactly. so you've, got the, you've got the provenance of the of the of the kind of the the the, the, the garment and where it's been and who it's you know who it's been looked after. So it, stewardship of kind of clothing, that's a cool thing. Yeah. And it, you know, it's a it's a very small design consideration, but what it recognizes and and you know, it signals to the buyer, like, oh, this can have life beyond mm-hmm. just the nice. single purchase that I'm making it for. And, you know, I think taking that approach is a one that ultimately, you know, it builds that trust, it builds that loyalty uh, with a customer base that is, you know, often very passionate, you know, about the environment and about the outdoors and how do we steward our natural resources. Awesome. I love that example. I, I have got some, some, I'm a kind of climber, uh, um, well, distinctly average, but quite enthusiastic climbing climber when I get the chance. Um, and so I have a bunch of some Patagonia kits, but I'd never actually seen the, 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 the name tag kind of thing. So that's actually kind of very, very cool. Uh, so thank you for sharing that. But Christian, um, that's all I have for today. So I just want to say, uh, thank you for helping me out with the quote for the prediction piece. That was great. It's going to make my life easier. Um, but Thank you for what you're doing in the in this kind of quest to deliver more personalized experiences because I think it matters. Um, and thank you for sharing your time and your insight and your expertise with us today. That's been super cool. Adrian, it has been a, a real pleasure. I've very much enjoyed the conversation and uh, yeah, definitely a fan of Punk CX. Thank you. Well. That was cool. I hope you enjoyed it. I did, and I always do actually, because I always learn something new when I speak to some of these amazing kind of people. And it's always something new that I can incorporate into my writing, speaking workshops, and other sort of advisory work that I do. Now, if you're interested in learning about any of that sort of stuff, uh, then you can find out more about how I work with clients over at adrianswisco.com. But one final thing before I go, please consider heading over to iTunes or Spotify or whichever podcast platform you choose to use, and do leave a review. Every little helps, as they say. Anyway, that's all for now. Thank you for listening. And do tune in again soon. All the very best. Cheers. Bye.